Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to all of you in person, a few of you, and online, of course. Thank you for joining. We're here today for the second ever edition of the Youth County Key Peace Prize, and we're so grateful to be able to host it here in this beautiful location in the Peace Palace. So, before we get started, I think I'll introduce ourselves as the host. I'm Leila. And I'm Clara, and we are from the Youth Peace Initiative, an international NGO based here in The Hague, promoting the meaningful participation of young people in peace processes. We're super excited to welcome you here today on the sixth anniversary of UN Security Council Resolution 2250 on Youth, Peace and Security. So today, to make this event happen and this whole prize happen, we've collaborated with three different organizations. So we have the Carnegie Foundation, Peace Palace, uh, who are the manager and owner of the Peace Palace. We have the world-class program of the city of The Hague and the Youth Peace Initiative, as Clara just introduced us. And uh, today we're here to award the Youth Carnegie Peace Prize, of course, and the title of ambassador, uh, the Youth Ambassador to the Peace Palace. So we're so excited to be able to award this to an outstanding peace building project. So um, the purpose of this award and this ceremony is to give a platform and recognition to the important work that young people are doing in peace building. Uh, we've received, we've put out a call for applications and we've received many submissions in video forms from all over the world. So we had some applications from Kosovo, Nigeria, Mexico and Nepal, for example. And today we're so excited that we can finally uh, introduce to you the winner of this application. So we also want to take this day and this ceremony to start a discussion about the role of young people in peace building. So this is why we've, um, we've invited some speakers. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, also online, thank you for the Young Peace Builders join, joining us. Um, and just one final note to say that this online event is of course in line with COVID measures. And we're so grateful that we're able to host this in the Great Hall of Justice of the Peace Palace, which is the United Nations International Court of Justice. So before we start with the actual program, we would like to send a special welcome to all, to all the excellencies and ambassadors here today, to Pete Hein Donner, president of the Carnegie Foundation Peace Palace, Saskia Braunes, deputy mayor and alderman for international affairs of the municipality of The Hague, Elizabeth Wesseling van Gent, chair of the prize committee, Ali Altiorg and Irena Grisel, researchers in the field of youth, peace and security, and of course to all the young people out there. So all the students from the World Class The Hague program and the young peace builders that are joining us online here today. Welcome. So as we start off the program, we, would, we hear a word of welcome by Mr. Donna, president of the Carnegie Foundation Peace Palace. Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear listeners, it's an honor and pleasure for me as president of the Kanagi Foundation to welcome you in the Peace Palace. Our meeting will be both live and online. It means that I'm addressing a larger audience than ever would fit into the palace, but at the same time that part of that audience can't actually see and experience the Peace Palace, which is sad. The Peace Palace was founded in a time when war was still very much a question of armed conflict between states. Its establishment is a result of the ambition to prevent war by settling conflicts between states by way of judicial process instead of arms. It was built with the funds of Andrew Carnegie and with materials and artworks donated by countries from all over the world. It's thus a monument from the world for the world. But it's much more. It has become an icon in our search for peace through law, a temple of peace, as its founder, Andrew Carnegie, used to call it. For over a century, the Peace Palace houses two of the most prestigious international courts, the Permanent Court of Arbitration and the International Court of Justice and its predecessor. Both courts enjoy a growing caseload. In addition, the Peace Palace 
houses one of the largest libraries in the field of international law and is home for the Hague Academy of International Law, whose courses are annually attended by over a thousand students from all over the world. However, peace is not just the absence of war between states. Conflicts are increasingly fought between armed groups, segments of the population, and the governments and their citizens. Moreover, peace is not just the absence of armed conflict, it is a general state in which people can live their daily life without being constantly on the alert for threats of violence, insecurity, and physical or economic destitution. Peace, therefore, is not just the responsibility of governments, but of each one of us. As Eleanor Roosevelt once said, it isn't enough to talk about peace, one must believe in it. And it isn't enough to believe in it, one must work at it. That is why the Peace Palace is glad to host the award of the Kanagi Youth Peace Prize. Young people are directly concerned by questions of peace. The UN Security Council Resolution on Youth, Peace and Security of December 2015 finds that young people often form the majority of the population of countries affected by armed conflict and concludes that a large youth population presents a unique demographic dividend that can constitute can contribute to lasting peace and economic prosperity if inclusive policies are in place. The purpose of the Kanagi Youth Peace Prize is to highlight and honor the role of youth in local, national, and international peace-building activities. Peace through law is our mission here at the Peace Palace, but the Carnegie Foundation, as owner of the Peace Palace, sees it also as its function to promote peace by dialogue and educating people. We are therefore grateful that despite the current situation, we have the opportunity to do so by hosting a meeting that highlights the share of young people in building peace and in which, albeit online, people from all over the world can honor those participating in those activities. We are honored and grateful to have you with us today and wish you an inspiring meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Donner. I think you, you did a great job at really pointing out the positives of this hybrid event because just this time last year, we were forced to do everything online. So this is such an honor and we're very excited to actually be here in person. And thank you for the history of the Peace Palace as well. I think it's a great way to start us off with um, our thoughts about peace building and about youth. Um, so thank you for your words. And now to give you a little bit of a taste of the submissions that we received for this Peace Prize, we're going to show you a compilation of the five shortlisted videos for this Peace Award. So enjoy the compilation. Hello everyone, my name is Neven Ardosavljevic and this is my Peace Story. Welcome to the circle, I'm happy to see you after today. Five years ago, I co-founded an NGO with other friends named Agora, where we are promoting civic engagement among young people to prevent violence and to promote peace. 
Interfaith Pakistan is a unique idea to uplift communities and aim to promote interfaith harmony, peace and tolerance and women empowerment in Pakistan through digital content creation. We are digital revolutionary organization. I am a peace advocate, mobilizing youth, supporting and networking with NGOs, INGOs and IGOs and influencing state actors to contribute to peace building. In the long term, we hope to create a global network of environmental health solutions, fostering intercultural collaboration, especially in a time of division. Since the organization's founding, the Peace Building Project has advocated for the protection and rights of vulnerable populations such as refugees and people facing conflict situations. So hopefully you also enjoyed this little insight into these great um, submissions that we have received this year. Before we announce the winner, um, we would like to discuss a little bit more the role of young people in peace processes. How can youth meaningfully contribute to peace processes? And of course also what are the barriers and the challenges that they are facing? Ali Altiok and Irena Grisel are co-authors of the UN report, We Are Here, an integrated approach to youth inclusive peace processes. We're so excited and honored to have them join us here, have them here today and to hear more about their findings and the research that they have done. Welcome Ali and Irena. Hello, testing. <laughs> Do you hear me? Do you see me? Great. We hear you, we see you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. It's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here virtually with you all today among such esteemed representatives and impressive peace builders. I want to start by focusing on and highlighting what the Carnegie Peace Prize seeks to do, and that is recognition. This is one of the key intentions of the youth peace and security agenda, as well as what we sought to do with the global policy paper titled We Are Here. And that is to give greater recognition to young people in the work that they do to prevent violence, resolve conflict, and build sustainable peace. With or without recognition, young people and men are already active and mobilizing, taking brave initiatives to bridge divides, advocate for justice, and contribute to peaceful and equitable societies. We see this throughout history. It's not something that's new. Young people young women and young men are often at the forefront of social and political movements to bring positive change. We see this at the community, national and international levels. This was the inspiration for the We Are Here paper to document and research exactly this. Recognizing that peace processes are often at the heart of conflict transformation for society facing conflict and where young people are particularly marginalized from decision-making spaces. Despite the fact that over 1,000 peace agreements have been signed in the last 20 years, there had been very little research and understanding of how young people actually shape and engage in the lead up to an implementation of peace agreements. And this is surprising and has been mentioned when we know that young people often constitute the majority population in countries with ongoing peace processes and are indeed the largest demographic in the world today. And so through documenting, researching, and highlighting where, how, and what roles young people take during peace processes, we strive to better understand and support young people's critical participation and influence in sustaining peace. What we find is that young people play these crucial roles in, being, in building bridges across societal divides. There are powerful initiatives, some of which have been presented through the video that we'll hear more about today, that young people take in mobilizing the public for peace and humanitarian issues. And we must recognize the fact that young people are the inevitable leaders in building reconciliation following violent conflict across generations to come. The contributions that young people make are often considered informal. 
And this is troubling because they need to be recognized as crucial foundations to everyday peace that support the formal political processes that they're often marginalized from, particularly young women who often face this double marginalization of being young and being a woman, recognizing and investing in their unique potential and approaches to conflict resolution and peace building is critical to a more inclusive and peaceful society. In conclusion, we cannot ignore young people if we want real peace, but recognition is only the first step. And I turn to my good friend Ali to focus on how we can move beyond recognition to better support and investing in young peace builders. Ali, over to you. Thank you, Irena. Um, today we are celebrating the sixth anniversary of the Youth Peace and Security Agenda. I cannot think of a better day to celebrate the agency and leadership of young people for peace. One of the biggest problems the Youth Peace and Security Agenda addresses is the negative and misleading stereotypes associating young people with violence. These stereotypes portray young men with guns and young women consigned to the passive status of victimhood and young migrants as criminals or even as terrorists. Actually, there are very few young people involved in violence or crime very few of them join in extremist armed groups. But majority of young people are trying to get, get on with their lives. More importantly, despite the planet created by previous generations is literally collapsing with climate change, extreme e economic inequalities driven by fourth industrial revolution, mass migration caused by climate change, many young people are able to imagine a peaceful, world and involved in creative peace building projects. For six years, the Youth Peace and Security Agenda focused on documenting the good peace building work young people do, like Rea. Today, um, we finally start appreciating and giving acknowledgement to the most talented young peace builders, like my dear friend, Leonardo Paraga. The missing peace study requested by the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2250, documented the peace building work of thousands of young people. Um, and in the VR Here paper with my dear colleague and friend Irena, we summarize how young people influence, influence peace processes. These resources reveals how young people address all forms of violences from gender-based violence to armed conflicts, criminal or terrorist forms of violence. But don't be mistaken, we just scratched the surface. No other segment of society sees the interaction between different forms of violences as young people do. Young people build the connection between the local and the global through media, poetry, film, and technological innovation. All this good work done by young people is underutilized, but also under-resourced. The world still spends trillions of dollars for war, hard security-based counterterrorism operations, while not even 1% of these resources allocated for youth peace initiatives. We need to do three things to go beyond recognizing peace building agency of young people. First, as it is obvious, we need to invest in capacities of young people and we need to invest in their leadership. Second, we, if we are serious about moving beyond acknowledging the peace building agency of young people, then we should also change our approach to partnerships with young people. Young people must be viewed as equal partners in peace building. Institutions need to understand that they are not doing a favor by working with young people. Young people do these institutions a favor. Third, we also need to acknowledge that exclusion and marginalization of young people is a systemic problem rooted in the unjust economic systems oppressive state structures, legacies of colonial practices and mindsets. We need to address the violence of exclusion caused by these systems. And lastly, to close, we need to move from youth peace and security to youth peace and justice as we are now speaking in the um, Peace Palace. Thank you. Uh, 
Ali and Irina, thank you so much for your contribution and your speech. And I think it's safe to say that your work is an inspiration for many people. It was actually an inspiration for this event, for us. Um, so thank you so much for being here with us. I'm looking at you in the camera. <laughs> um, and after these very important and inspiring words, I'd like to invite Elizabeth Besseling van Gent for the laudatory speech. The floor is yours. Excellencies, distinguished guests, Nigeria, Egypt, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Mexico, Gambia, Kosovo, Pakistan, Finland, and the United States of America. These are just some of the countries from which we have received applications for the 2021 Youth Carnegie Peace Prize. And we are truly honored that this young prize, which was awarded for the first time in 2018, is now already able to reach out to different countries and cultures around the world. All the people and organizations that have applied for this award have one thing in common. They give their time, share their knowledge, and spread their hope to actively and practically contribute to peace building. According to our founder, Andrew Carnegie, education and peace are the most important conditions for personal and social developments. As we have just heard from the keynote speakers, it is precisely the young generation that plays a crucial role in the field of education and peace. With the Youth Carnegie Peace Prize, we want to give recognition to the work of young peace builders and aim that to inspire, encourage others to start their own projects. The members of the jury and the board of the Carnegie Foundation watched all the submitted videos several times and all jury members were really impressed with the work that is done by these young peace builders all over the world. As you can imagine, making a decision was not easy, but the complexity of one specific project particularly amazed us because the project's aim is not only to prevent or resolve conflicts, but also to face conflicts. Give them a name and try to transform them. It is, second, an international project, but it focuses on the engagement of local communities. It's a symbiosis of scientific research and active efforts in the field. It offers online platforms, but at the same time, the project's volunteers personally visit local communities that, they, that do not have access to the internet. The project implemented a two-pronged approach, which on the one hand focuses on research and building partnerships, and on the other hand, advocacy, campaigning, and community engagement. And last but not least, its starting point is not us versus them, but us versus the problem. What started in 2017 as research at the University of Chicago has grown into a successful international organization, a volunteer-led organization that promotes a culture of peace, education, and understanding. One of their local projects is the Rohingya Literacy Program in New Delhi, where they teach language and computer skills to young children to, as they say, pave a way to a stable education. The conviction that education is the basis for peace building is expressed in their motto, educate, 
empower, engage. Perhaps all these paraphrases and hints have already caught the winner's attention. But nevertheless, I would like to officially announce the winner of the 2021 Youth Carnegie Peace Prize. The Peace Building Project by Rea Mahanta. A moment. Rea, this is your prize. Congratulations. There are many institutes that study global conflicts, but few that explore the peace processes by which those conflicts may be prevented, resolved, or transformed. It is to harness this realm that an idea was born in the University of Chicago in 2017 to start a conversation on conflict transformation and peace building. I am Ria Mahanta, founder and president of the Peace Building Project, an international volunteer-led initiative that aims to build a culture of peace through research, dialogue, advocacy and community engagement. Since the organization's founding, the Peace Building Project has advocated for the protection and rights of vulnerable populations such as refugees and people facing conflict situations. Some of our programs, such as the Rohingya Literacy Program, implemented in New Delhi, provided a scope for Rohingya children to learn language and computer skills as a doorway to stable education. The Rohingya Literacy Program was backed by written publications, dialogue sessions, and letter campaigns to raise awareness about the Rohingya refugee crisis. Similarly, a number of our other initiatives draw attention on international politics, cultivate discourse, and translate that knowledge into actionable service. Let me invite one of our team members, Ryan Mitra, to speak more about this. Thanks, Ray. I'd like to tell you about two of our flagship initiatives. The letter campaign. The campaign is designed to serve as civil society action by highlighting a theme, issue, or crisis in each letter, providing unbiased background and seeking action from the stakeholders. The final draft of each letter is preceded by rigorous research to ensure different nuances of the issue are considered before seeking signatures and delivering it to the intended party. The purpose of this campaign is to influence key policy decisions by making the position of the civil society clear. All the letters are directed to members of parliament, political representatives, civil servants, and other key decision makers. Our other initiative is the Dialogue Forum. It is focused on hosting a thematic issue-based conversation with domain and field experts where, uh, where young and upcoming peace builders can engage with them to learn about the experiences and nuances. Now, why do we host this platform? It is to raise awareness amongst the youth, stir action and support for human rights, and finally to advance the role of the youth in peace building. We've hosted multiple sessions, such as on, on India's farm laws, caste and gender violence, role of youth in peace building, artificial intelligence and privacy. So as you can see, the Peace Building Project has a two-pronged approach for youth engagement on matters of international significance. First, through research, dialogue and partnership building, and then aiming to create change through advocacy, campaigning and community engagement. Through this hybrid model, we hope that our volunteers will become informed and experienced peace builders who are able to resolve conflicts in their lives and in their work and advocate for the rights of others through a culture of peace and understanding. This is the Peace Building Project. Many congratulations to Rhea and her colleagues from the Peace Building Project. We wish we could have her here today in person Unfortunately, that is not possible yet, but we hope that one day in the future we can welcome her. But we have Rhea here with us, well, almost in person on the screen, and we're so happy um, to see you, to speak with you now. And yeah, Rhea, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Um, good evening to everyone watching. I am truly overwhelmed at the honor and although I had prepared a few remarks, I am left almost speechless on the jury's decision and faith in our project. Thank you to the Carnegie Foundation, Peace Palace, and Youth Peace Initiative for this incredible opportunity where peace builders from all over the world can come together and share their projects with each other. 
I'm truly humbled to be representing the Peace Building Project in acceptance of this prestigious award. As all of you could see from the video, the Peace Building Project is a volunteer-led initiative. And when I was reflecting on our journey as an organization, I realized that we started as a team of just one. But over the last four years, we have had over 40 volunteers who joined our team and helped advance our cause. It really is a milestone for us to have come this far, expanding a conversation of peace across national boundaries. And I want to thank the organizers and everyone in the audience for giving us the opportunity to recognize that today. Although the project was founded in 2017, I want to share with you the story behind the idea of the project, which began a much longer time ago. In 2008, when I was a young teenager in school, attending class on a normal day, we suddenly heard a low rumble that shook our ground, disrupting our classes and causing visible tension among teachers and students alike. As it turns out, a violent extremist group had just detonated a series of nine bombs all over our state of Assam in Northeast India, sending shockwaves across our city, killing close to 100 people and injuring 500 others. School was dismissed and students were sent home. When my mother, who works at the state government hospital, came to pick me up from school, we drove straight to the emergency room as she was on duty that day. So I followed her to the ER and as I walked in, I saw hundreds of patients in excruciating pain, some with missing limbs and some sprawled on the floor because there weren't enough beds to match the number of people who needed urgent medical attention. I just stood in the corner watching this and wondering why it was necessary to bring about this level of violence. This day really had a lasting impact on me and defined the questions and priorities that I wanted to dedicate my life to. And based on what I have found through my education and experiences over the years, I can say today with firm conviction that while there are many ways of achieving a desired outcome, violence is not one of them irrespective of what socioeconomic or political change we are trying to bring about. Peace is the only way forward. But as a society, we were not adequately equipped with the knowledge and practical skills to deal with conflict through peace negotiations and dialogue. And that is why I found a need to begin a conversation about conflict resolution and peacemaking, both through an academic lens, as well as with practical engagement. That is the rationale behind the Peace Building Project, to explore constructive ways of engaging on matters of peace and security, encourage our youth and empower vulnerable populations such as refugees to become agents of peace to tackle the world's pressing challenges. This idea would not have come to fruition without the volunteers who dedicate their time and efforts to the cause. I want to take a moment to acknowledge all of you who have in some way or another contributed to the Peace Building Project. This award goes to all of you, dear volunteers, for your spirit and dedication. I also want to thank our friends and well-wishers who have gone out of their way to support us. And I want to thank my fellow Peace Builders here today. Your work inspires us, and I hope that one day we can build a strong alliance across different fields of expertise to strive together in this global movement for peace. Thank you once again to the Peace Palace for giving us this platform and for bestowing upon us this honor. I look forward to our journey together. Ria, thank you so much for your speech and for sharing this very powerful story as well. Um, and it's really amazing to hear your convictions and your determination in the work that you do. It's really inspiring. Um, and we would really, we thought it would be really important today to open up a discussion and to get a bit more insights from you and also from Ali and Irina, who also have a lot of experience in this field of peace building. So uh, we're going to open up the question and answers part of this session. 
Um, I encourage you as well, the people who are here in person, to think of some questions if you'd like. You can give me a sign at some point. Um, but to get started, Ria, um, could you share with us what is one of the biggest obstacles or challenges that you face as a young person working in peace building? Thank you for the question. And I'm glad we start with the challenges because there are also ways forward uh, which we can get to. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we have faced, um, especially as a youth led organization is to find entry points in the field of peace and security. Uh, because peace and security in many countries is still a, a relatively new science. Um, subjects like conflict resolution are still very new in the academic realm. And uh, most of the political negotiations on peace and security have um, been dealt with by um, traditional partners like governments and political actors. So as a youth-led volunteer organization, it's extremely hard um, to make the traditional apparatus recognize the importance of youth participation in peace processes. So my short answer would be gaining entry points for youth. Mm -hmm. Great answer, thank you. And you mentioned there are ways forward. Maybe you can give us a little bit of a, an insight into those ways forward. Sure. Um, I think there are many ways to go about it, and one of them is um, building credibility over the years. So we always start at the grassroots because you need the trust of the communities first before you can progress to gaining trust of the actors that provide services to them. So um, that relationship with the community is extremely important. And at the same time, um, um, the reason why we have a two-pronged approach is because we want to back up our community engagement um, with um, academic standing as well. So um, providing training, skills training, and uh, workshops and courses, making them available to our volunteers and to our youth ensures that the youth are skilled enough to gain and develop their expertise in this field so that even if not today, but at least five or six years from now, they would be the experts that governments and traditional actors, as well as non-traditional actors, um, would hire and invite into this space of peacemaking. And uh, to bring it back to your peace building project specifically, could you give us an idea of this? You mentioned five to six years from now. What, what would that look like for your own project? What is your future or what are your goals that you're trying to achieve? Um, that's actually a very difficult question to answer because four years ago, um, I could not predict uh, how far this project would go and um, uh, how I developed this idea, uh, how I planned out this idea in 2017 was very different from uh, the kind of uh, structure and shape that it has taken up today. So it would be difficult to say what it would look like five or six years from now, but I think um, our aim would be to advance um, the youth peace and security agenda in a way that partners reach out to us um, to, um, to take advantage of our expertise in this field, to involve them in peace negotiations, uh, and also to kind of build the bridge between the peace and security and the humanitarian nexus. Um, from our video, you could see that um, our, our focus is on refugees. This is also because we want to empower the populations that understand conflict the most to also be the leading agents of peace. So I think five or six years from now, I would consider it um, a, a, a huge step if we are able to uh, ensure that any of our beneficiaries or the refugee populations that we have worked with are able to uh, be on such platforms and be uh, advocating for peace. Uh, with their communities, with their governments, um, uh, in order to um, build a future where they can go back to their home countries and build their nations, as well as wor work with host communities for social cohesion and promoting peace among the, uh, their communities. Thank you so much. You mentioned that you um, that you didn't you didn't have a clear picture because it's hard to say five years in advance. But it sounds like you have very 
ambitious goals and uh, I wish you all the best of luck, of course, but I'm looking forward to being more in touch with you, of course, throughout this process. And I think, Clara, you have a few questions as well. Yeah, for... I also have some questions prepared um, to the two researchers um, and keynote speakers. So I hope that this is going to work out again, but um, so far it's been going quite well with the hybrid event. I'm quite impressed with this, all this technique. So I have a question for Irena. Um, Irena, what inspires you or what, what motivates you most to do the work that you do? Thank you very much for the question and congratulations once again, Ria, to you and your whole team in the really impressive work that you've done. Um, a, a kudos and a salute to you from afar as a fellow peace builder. So um, what inspires me or motivates me uh, in the work that I do um, it's a long and complicated answer, but I think also simply uh, puts, and perhaps it resonates with many of us um, who come from violent backgrounds. Uh, myself, I'm born in Sarajevo, uh, originally from Bosnia Herzegovina, and I fled violent conflict as a child with my family. And this wasn't so fundamental to shaping my perspective until I became an adult. And I realized that despite talking about not wanting a repetition of the past, violent conflict continues to be pervasive today. And this fails our younger generations. We continue to fail um, the younger generations and their prospects for a peaceful future. And what motivates me, I would say, particularly having worked in Myanmar over the last five, six years with young people is the future potential and the existing power of young people in resolving violent conflict and really recognizing that the young generation is and must be at the heart of a sustainable, peaceful future. So what, what motivates me is working with one, uh, young leaders um, and with, with young people who take such initiatives that are so fundamental to uh, a peaceful future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irina. There was, yeah, I, I think we can all agree that this is probably the most motivating thing, seeing what young people are doing out there. Um, I'm so impressed myself. So I also have a question for Ali. Um, if there's one message, Ali, that you could send out about youth in peace processes, what would this message be? Um, of course, I will try to be brief on this. Um, so there is, when we speak about peace processes, what we focus on is usually the table, the room, where high level negotiations takes place. But if you look outside of the room, you will see peace building agency of young people in all segments, in, at all levels. And, um, and what's happening in the last years is that the space for civic space has been shrinking. And if we want to support young people in peace processes, we need to protect the civic space where young people occupy and build uh, peace. So that would be my... Um, uh, the top point I, I would highlight. Yeah, thank you, Ali. And I, I think I agree. Um, to really move a little bit away from thinking that this is, there's only one way that peace process can look like and seeing the diversity, really. I think this is also the compilation that we've seen earlier, the, the in incredible diversity, what peace processes and peace work can look like. And so are there any questions <laughs> in the audience? Is there anyone uh, we haven't seen any hands go up, maybe something will come up. Um, but yeah, I think... Um, Lila, do you have a question here? Yes? Um, a question to, to Ria. Congratulations on this award and uh, very impressive to see what you and uh, your colleagues have, uh, have been doing. What is it, um, if you were to, to meet, let's say, a Carnegie of our time, what is it you would need most in terms of support for scaling up your efforts? Um, thank you so much for your question, Director. Um, it's an honor to be here, to be invited here. Thank you again for this platform. Uh, in terms of what kind of support we would need, um, the first thought that comes to every peace building organization's mind, I think, would be funding. And while that is uh, very important, um, I would emphasize that till date, we have been able to run as an organization without any funding for four years. So building peace is possible without funding. 
because dialogue is essentially just conversations between people, between communities. The kind of support that we would need is for the international community to work with the stalwarts, the international organizations present in, in our countries, uh, in our country of operations um, for, for creating, uh, for leveraging that relationship to allow us to gain entry points. Um, because right now the established organizations um, already work with the populations we work with and they have the resources and the grants um, and the networks. So for us to build it up from scratch and to build that trust is a difficult process. So it would be really helpful if international organizations um, could gain, um, gain advice from foundations um, like the Carnegie Foundation to kind of engage young youth-led peace-building organizations like ours to, um, to jointly implement projects with us or to uh, work together with us um, to, to apply for grants as well. Thank you, Ria. And I'm looking around the room if there's a final question, perhaps. I don't see anything. So um, and it, we're also pretty good in time, which is great. Um, so yeah, to close the ceremony, we would like to welcome Saskia Braunisch, Deputy Mayor and Alderman for International Affairs of the Municipality of The Hague, City of Peace and Justice, to provide her last thoughts and final remarks. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and also dear students, I would like to begin to congratulate uh, Ria Mahanta on winning the Youth Carnegie Peace Prize. Congratulations to you. And I'm very impressed with the work you are doing with the peace building project and also the words you spoke to us were very impressed, impressing. I understand that you will be the youth ambassador for the coming year and I'm convinced that uh, you can inspire us all during this difficult period for well, for everyone. I would also like to thank the other candidates for their submissions. It is incredibly beautiful and heartwarming to see so many and sometimes small peace initiatives taking place worldwide. And also a special thanks to Leonardo Parago, the previous award winner and youth ambassador. I know that it has sometimes been difficult for you to do your job in Colombia. The Hague is globally known as the international city of peace and justice, a place where every day thousands of people work for a better, fairer and safer world. The most famous symbol of peace in The Hague is the Peace Palace the location from which we are now broadcasting this ceremony, as already said. And the Peace Palace has been this peace symbol for over a hundred years, and during this time, several important conferences, lawsuits, and trials have been taking place here that have brought peace and stability closer. Unfortunately, the pandemic now means that you are only virtually present in the Peace Palace. But I hope you will be able to visit this special place and city in the future. Ria, in 2017, you started the Peace Building Project, a project in challenging neighborhood in Chicago with a lot of conflict. And you have made a brave decision then. You try to change that situation with all the knowledge and skills you learned at the university that's situated in the same neighborhood. And I'm sure that you will inspire young people, students who are now watching. The success of your organization truly deserves the Youth Carnegie Peace Prize. I am proud that several youth initiatives in the field of peace and justice have been launched here in The Hague, such as the UN Youth Impact and the Youth Peace Initiative, organizations that helped this ceremony to be made possible. 
The municipality of The Hague started the world class program, the world class program a few years ago. It's a talent program that connects international students to the city, to the organizations that are located here and to each other. And impressive initiatives have been launched from this program. Last year, a number of world-class students did a survey for us on the value of peace prizes and what they mean for the prize winners and the city that awards these prizes. In The Hague, we are fortunate that several peace prizes and awards here are, <coughs> sorry, are awarded here every year. And the Hewitt Carnegie Peace Prize is a very important one, and I'm therefore very happy that the ceremony could take place in these, in, in, in these uncertain times. Many thanks for the Carnegie Foundation for this. Finally, I would like to conclude with a quote from world-class lecture that King Abdullah II of Jordan gave in The Hague in 2018. I think his words are striking and inspiring for us all. I quote, Take what you learn here and put it to work in your community, in your classroom, your sports group, your workplace. Find that person you don't know, someone of a different faith or background. Talk and listen with respect. Continue the dialogue because you are building the links that hold the world together. Thank you very much. quote to finish with and I'm really um, I'm really inspired again I say that word a lot but <laughs> by the fact that you highlighted the bravery of Ria and all other young peace builders around the world because that is also why we're having this event now is to really highlight the bravery of these of these young peace builders and we this was really highlighted in the submissions that we received um, so thank you for highlighting that. And also, as one last time for the camera of here, thank you for submitting all these applications from around the world. Um, I'm really feeling, once again, inspired. <laughs> and it's been a very thought-provoking afternoon. So I hope uh, you all had a very good time here in person and online. Thank you so much for joining us. And Clara, I'll hand yeah, it I over to you. Yeah, I think thought-provoking is a really good... Um, term to use here. This has been very thought-provoking and I think the discussion that we had and the comments that we had by the keynote speakers and by the winner, they really, um, yeah, I think they showed us that we need to continue this conversation. And I really would like to encourage everyone to continue this conversation and also to stay in touch, to reach out to us, um, to Youth Peace in Initiative and then the Carnegie Foundation and also the World Class um, the Hague, so the three partner organizations, um, and to be in touch with us, to um, take, to reach out via social media. Um, I think this is important to continue, and we hope that we will speak to you in the future. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.